Welcome to the Black Geek Podcast. I'm John Washington, CEO and Editor-in-Chief of Fawcett Media, and I'll be your host for each show where we take an unapologetically Black approach to profiling people and stories that demonstrate capability, significance, and influence with our community. Today, we welcome Executive Director from New Leaf Project, Jeanette Ward-Horton. New Leaf Project's mission is to build intergenerational wealth via legal cannabis in industry for the communities disproportionately harmed by cannabis criminalization. Their program are designed to increase success outcomes for people of color in the cannabis industry, either as business owners or professionals. Welcome, Jeanette. You know, to, to Black B. You know, <laughs> you know, and I'm glad I got you here, girlfriend. You know, so I don't know where you come from with you, but tell us a little bit about how you show up on the scene. Who is Jeanette? Tell us a little <laughs> bit about Jeanette. Jeanette just showed up on the scene. Here she is. Tell us Thank a little you. bit about the background there. Where you come from? Thank you for having me um, mm -hmm. on Black Beat. I appreciate that. I come from Atlanta, Georgia. That's where oh, I girl. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't mad at you. That's where I was born and raised. And then I went to college at Spelman College. So um, that's really where my roots are. I've been in, in Portland almost uh, four and a half years now. Wow, sister, well, welcome. I'm so glad. So how do you, how you find our predominantly white Northwest state, you know, you know how, how you live it? <laughs> you know? uh, so, I got- What's going on with you since you've been here? I, I got, how do I find it? Well, I find it um, to definitely have been uh, a shock if I'm frank, because I had lived in Atlanta and I, um, didn't even, I didn't realize that the rest of America wasn't majority black practically <laughs> until I was in middle school and learned the stats. I, you know, it was just an unusual place to grow up. And then, um, yeah, it's pretty much where I was that in New York, very diverse places. And then Oregon, um, it was just a different environment. It's good. It's good to learn something new and do something, um, do something new. And I've, um, you know, what a beautiful place to be. We were just talking about you fishing a few moments ago. It's a definitely a beautiful, beautiful part of the country. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, you know, that's one of the main reasons, Jeanette, I stay. I mean, I don't stay cause it's predominantly, predominantly white. I mean, I think it's probably the Northwest is still like a new frontier. You know, it's uh, you can fish and hunt and do all that kind of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why I stay here. It's the greater outdoors. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. But you know, the fight's here. I mean, you'd rather not, if you know it or not, the front line is right here, you know, in the fight, you know, so that's another reason why we stay here. But can you tell us a little bit about your project, about the New Leaf Project. How'd that come into play? And tell us a little bit about that. Definitely. So New Leaf Project was founded in 2018 in Portland, Oregon. And um, we were um, founded um, really in response to Portland, Oregon voters um, made, made Portland the first city to, to cut checks uh, from cannabis taxes to Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities to help repair harm. And one of the ways that um, Portland voters said they wanted to do that was by investing in cannabis businesses owned by Black, Indigenous, and Latinx people. And so New Leaf Project was really formed um, to help move those funds to, to those businesses. And then um, as we've grown, really um, do as you read our mission, help build generational wealth for black and brown people through the cannabis industry. And we do that through activism, like working on the state equity bill, uh, state cannabis equity bill, as well as through practically finding funders and finding sources of capital for Black, Indigenous, and Latinx businesses, um, because it's just a real need. Wow, wow! You know, uh, you know, sister, you right on time with that. I, you know, that's a uh, that's definitely somebody's thinking ahead of the curve on this one. How does uh, how does the project address equity hurdles for marginalized groups? Yeah, so it really. Um, first thing we do is is focus on capital is figure out how we can get more funds in the form of grants and loans today but looking at you know all the forms of capital so that we can get just more lines of capital more you know pipelines of capital to black indigenous and latinx business owners in in that order um, if I can quote Mama D, because that's the order in which you see the lack of capital in our businesses. So we really have a focus for some on black businesses and are just um, uh, 
unique in the in our success rates of getting funds to black businesses and that's really um th that's the first thing that we do and then the next thing that we do is one-on-one -on -one with entrepreneurs really figure out what do they need to get to their next goal um, are they trying to launch their product in the market and it's the first time they've worked on a food product and so we help get them uh, to a food commercialization class and they can learn how to bring a product to market it really just depends on what the entrepreneur needs right on right on right on so what do you think uh, the stigmas are around cannabis in the black community sister tell me a little bit about what you believe is you know those things going on you know that that interplay yeah, it's um a complex interplay so um, you know, my own story, when I got to the cannabis industry, I, I came here to lead marketing and, and um, PR for a tech company. And then I looked around at the industry and it was wider than corporate America where I'd come from. And so the first thing I think a lot of people of color feel, especially black people, when they get to the industry is, um, there's a word I'm not saying that's really what's coming to my head. Like, I can't believe. You can say it here. <laughs> <laughs> This is the way you can say it. If you're going to say anything, say it right here. Yeah, there's definitely a word where I would say, you know, yeah, I can't believe, insert that word, I can't believe. I'm looking at this room and it's wider than corporate America, which has a terrible diversity problem. And now I'm looking at this room of a plant that had so much financial impact, uh, not to mention, you know, an emotional toll, but real, real impact on, on our lives and on our community. So that was just shocking to me and I couldn't sit sit and let that be and not try to do something. Um, so yeah, that's that's how, that's you know, the first thing is just, I think you called it the irony, just sitting with whatever that emotion is to see um, the profit that's largely going to white men on a plant that largely took wealth from black community. So we wanna, we wanna fix that. There's an opportunity to fix that and, and create more equity in who benefits from this industry. Yeah, tell me about it, cause uh, you know, you know, you know how many brothers and sisters of ours done did the time behind some old jive ass stuff. So we don't want to even hear that. Mm -mm. You know, oh, that beat is a dead beat, you know, uh, or it is not the black beat. It is the white beat. You know, it's the white beat down. You know, it's the way we they do us sometimes in these industries. You know, it's because technology was the same way. Mm -hmm. They got on the train and just jetted right on that and little young white males and they just did their thing. And they got so far down the track, they, they started thinking, this damn, we going on this party together on this train, but shit, ain't no women on this train. <laughs> so, so, so they had to stop the train for a second, let some women on it. But then they realized they got further down the track, even with women playing, you out there partying, you have a great time making all that money. So, so you ain't got no music, you ain't got no vibration, you ain't got no frequency, you ain't got nothing else that's fun. So let's go back and get some of them minority people. You, you know what I'm saying? So they had to slow down and come back and get us. And by now, you know, we they was already down the track so far, they had already settled. But it's, it's like these industries tend to do that. And we trying to stay a little bit ahead of the curve, not be, know somebody trying to catch up to the train but we sort of like to show up at the station when everybody else is showing up at the station right i think collectively as a community i feel because this year i've had this conversation with other people that we saw technology is the industry most people bring up we saw that train pass us right by and by the time you said as it stopped it was so far down the track that we should have been on at the beginning and i think we're all collectively as a community saying not this train you know, and I think we all feel really emotional about this train in particular. And then I think we're going to start saying not the other trains, you know, new industries don't come along very often. And I think we've collectively learned, you know, when a new industry takes off, we, we want to be at the table. And one of those hurdles we have to lower, it's capital. And then it's a lot of um, regulatory requirements that just make it complex that, that mean you've got to hire a bunch of experts, which also means you need capital. So, um, you know, those are some of the things we need to fix. Federal legalization will help from a tax perspective. It's hard to make money in cannabis. So you, you need a lot of money to really, um, in some cases, float your business until profitability. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so tell me a little bit more since we're down this river going down this way, uh, what business support does uh, New Leaf offer businesses? Um, so we offer, as I said, the, a very one-on-one -on -one support, then it'll range from aligning someone with a class. So food commercialization was the example I gave earlier 
to um, aligning them with one of the things that our community misses um, as well are, are networks. So we don't have, um, you know, an uncle who knows someone who's a venture capitalist. We don't have those network connections that sometimes um, those with privilege forget is what got them in the door. So one of the things that we do is try to create network connections that get people in the door. So one of our entrepreneurs wanted to have a meeting. They're two big beverage distribution companies in town. And so you need to get in the door and get a meeting with one of those companies in order to potentially get the big, the big order, the big sale. So we make those kinds of connections. We made that connection for that entrepreneur. It's very one-on-one. -on -one. What's your goal? And then how do we utilize our network to um, solve whatever challenge you've got in front of you? Wow, sister, that's, that's, that's deep. You know, and, 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 you know and, and we are aware that you're doing some other big work too. You know, you, you're working on some major legislation. And now, now, you want to talk about something that got my attention, made you look very attractive. <laughs> you know, just the fact that you got a big brain. You know, the people, well, I said, God damn, that girl jumped right where the money source is. The people where they live go right in front of them instead of them saying, here I is, and this is what I'm bringing you. So tell us a little bit about the legislation you bring in to help BIPOC communities about, you know, 3112. Yeah, thank you. HB 3112, Oregon Cannabis Equity Act. So cannabis equity has become a standard in other legalized states where we've got adult um, legalization. States have begun to adopt cannabis equity. And it usually consists of uh, three parts. One is making those tax investments, taking money and saying, we're gonna put those towards repairing harm in black, indigenous and Latinx communities. Two, expungements. And uh, states have begun to set a standard of free automatic expungement. We have that um, in HB 3112. And then last, cannabis equity licenses. So those are the three parts, all of which we have in HB 3112 in the Equity Act. Uh, we do some things a little bit different. One, we amass a significant ongoing fund for that reparative justice investment from two sources, cannabis taxes and the criminal fines account. Criminal fines account is where you pay a speeding ticket or where you pay a cannabis charge. So again, our community most definitely disproportionately paid into the criminal fines account. So those two accounts, cannabis taxes and criminal fines account, make up an $100 million fund uh, per biennium and growing for home ownership, land ownership, jobs, education, really saying the things that build wealth and income in Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities, those are the programs we're going to invest in. Um, and I am proud to say on this show, there's language in there that prioritizes those investments going into Black communities to, in terms of proportion, um, because our community proportionately, hands down, was the most um, the, the most over policed, the most disproportionately sentenced, the community that took the brunt of um, of you know of the economic detriment. I mean, you know, because I remember way back in the day when we was working on um, SB eleven, you know, when uh, over representation. I mean, for the jailhouse, you know, mm -hmm. where all the young people were going into the jailhouse. And, and the funny thing was that so were all the services and the treatment and all that other stuff for people. It was all going to the jailhouse. So in order for us to get well, we all had to go to the jailhouse to get well, you know? And so we so glad that you're out in front of this train a little bit right now, you know, waving your hand, say, yo, wait, wait a minute, slow down a little bit here. You know, uh, there are some other opportunities for you to get. And I think that that's very impressive from where I'm sitting at, especially for the black community, because they don't realize that as we are disproportionate in just about every which way you look, you can come outside on your porch any day of the week and just decide which way you're gonna walk to engage. And you can turn any direction you want to because systemic racism and all that stuff exists no matter where we look. But when we can take the time for ourselves to get out in front of some of these things and sort of lay some of the bricks as to where we want some of this thing to go and how it could help us, especially in the business capacity. We, we have a very finite um, possibility of, of almost coming to extinction in the state of Oregon as far as black business is concerned. People like to always say, well, we're doing great. We're doing this, we're doing that. Over here in the Seoul district where we at, I'm gonna tell you right now, we are taking some major hits. And for something like this to come in to sort of supplement and to somehow help with that fight, with this pathway, <laughs> as it is, we're glad, sister, you're standing in that in that line saying, hey, look here, let's bend this rail a little bit. Let's make sure it's turning going and going this way. So tell me, what's new on the agenda for, for NLP's agenda for the next move 
going into the future? Where y'all, what y'all gonna be doing? Tell me a little bit more about that. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I, I will, before I answer that, I will just say I am very passionate about the prospect of entrepreneurship, building generational wealth for our community. And, and about the self-determination we lost by losing entrepreneurs and, and black owned businesses at whatever level they grow to. Um, so where, and I appreciate your partnership where we can continue to partner, um, I, I will welcome because there's just such an opportunity, I think for us to interject right now and, and grab some of these tax dollars to do what tax dollars have been doing for businesses for years and years. It's just been missing our community. Yeah, you know, sis, I don't know how you feel about that. And as a as a black man, you know, I'm I'm struggling in these areas in in this time, you know, um, because I've been on the front line fighting for so many years, you know, and and we used to believe that the fight was ours, you know, and it was a sense that you know, from affirmative action to uh, the, the the reality of civil rights, you know, we. We stood on that that square and we fought that fight, fight because it was really clearly pointed at us, you know, as black folks, you know, in this country. And, you know, but as we grew, you know, it 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 just as you watched all the changes come, you know, you watched the diversity change come. It was a good idea, I thought, in the beginning, you know, but when you looked at it as it panned itself out, you know, everybody else was very successful in their campaigns on that platform. But it just seems like Blacks still, for some odd reason, were marginalized even within that capacity. But in today, you know, we, we get into these rooms now, and not only is the conversation about the need of the Black community there, it's the need of everybody else's community also in discussion. And we were standing in the front of the line for so long, you know, saying, hey, you know, we need some reparations or something over here to take care of our stuff. But now we're in this big blown out discussion about BIPOC and and all those types of things. And it just seems like every time we as black people go to the trough to say, hey, look it, we need some equity. We need some, some something to improve our condition. They, you know, the, the response back is always something like, well, why didn't you coming along with a bunch of other people? You know, why, why are you coming alone? You know, every time we stand alone to address some of our significant issues, you know, we always got to be coming there with a bunch of other folks, not just us. So what's your th thoughts and feelings about how equity and all that stuff is playing itself out? And even in this cannabis industry, we saw that they got off on the right step in looking at it. They were thinking about it. We were all sitting at the table, but yet it still didn't pan out to be equitable. It's still mm -hmm. only a couple of, uh, you know, retail people out there doing cannabis. And so what are, what's, your, what's your takes on all of that? I mean, just, you know, just a little bit about that race part of this, this race relations. Um, I think there are, I think you said a lot. <laughs> and I think, you know, your perspective, I appreciate it because you, you know, obviously had good history. I was young when affirmative action happened and you had good history that that felt like a good time and felt like things might be moving in the right direction and then didn't pan out like we intended. Um, I think there's a time we can stay in Oregon. I think there's a time and a power when you say this is about equity for black people and the Oregon Cares Act that set aside that money for black communities at the percentage of which we have black people in Oregon. Like it wasn't, it wasn't, it was an equal distribution. It was saying that this money should be fairly and equitably distributed. It wasn't radical. That to me made a lot of sense. Um, and that was just black folks alone. In terms of cannabis criminalization, the data sh tells us that it's black, indigenous, and then Latinx in terms of disproportionate arrest. And so we are really, um, so we have, you know, groups, it's black and brown, you could say, um, uh, coming to the table, but that's because in this case, that's what makes sense. That's what who was disproportionately um, impacted. And, and we look at at the rates of impact, and we are are equitable in distribution of of, of repair and, and money to make that repair. So, but a little bit different than it is in Atlanta, right? <laughs> oh yes, that's yes, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. In Atlanta, you would be having a different you. I mean, you'd be talking about black people. Um, yeah. That, that yeah, because yeah, well, uh, mm -hmm. I you know because you know that argument got settled real fast. But I don't know if you know it or not. I'm I'm from Savannah. No, I did not know. 
<laughs> you know, it was crazy. Hey, so tell me, how do people get a hold of your sister? I mean, they, how do they support they, you, you what you need, you know? Yeah, they can reach us at newleafproject.org. And I would love for anyone listening who's thinking about being a cannabis entrepreneur to send us an email, info at newleafproject.org. We've got an accelerator coming. So uh, an accelerator for cannabis businesses owned by people of color, a startup accelerator, as well as a jobs board. Um, to just try to create more opportunity for us to enter the cannabis industry. You'd asked about stigma before. And, you know, some people are feeling cautious about, about this plant that has caused so much harm. Um, so that makes sense too. So we, we hope we can just educate people about what the opportunities are and, and help people be more comfortable with um, the financial opportunity we think is here for our community. So just before we go, tell me, can you share with black people where you see the biggest opportunity at in this industry right now for them? Where, where you, are you making any suggestions to them? Would you suggest that, that, that you know, there's an area where you should go run to right now? Is there, is there any inside, any inside information at all? Where you should be going? <laughs> you know, let's see. Um, if you're thinking, what I always tell people if they're like, they want to touch the plant, um, cause you can always not touch the plant. I would say first think about what, what we call ancillary businesses you might want to do that don't touch the plant because there's a lot of upside and a lot of money to be made with services that support the industry. And you don't, and it costs a lot less money. You don't have to shell out the capital to have a license. But, um, if you really want to have a license and touch the plant and work with the plant, if you can get the capital together, my advice is go be a processor, go be a producer. It's where the best margins are. Um, that's where I'd go. Look at you. Do that. I am so so glad you decided to come on and share the day with us, you know, this morning. And these things, they don't run all day long and not fast, but boy, they short and sweet. And I show a lot of information y'all be dropping, boy, because y'all be bringing some game to the to people who are gameless to some degree about some of these pathways. And, I, and I'm really glad that you opened the eyes of some people, man, and letting them see that there's bigger opportunities out there. But we need people like you standing in the gap, moving these agendas forward and understanding how these agendas get moved forward. So I'm really impressed by the way that you have come in and, and, and put together this package and gotten it, and getting it in front of the right people for some decisions to be made and saying, hey, look here, neither y'all gonna do this, get in the game with us, do this, or y'all just gonna keep talking about it. So I keep appreciate you pushing the agenda, my sister. And again, much respect to you. And I'm so glad you showed up on Black Beat. <laughs> so unapologetically Black. <laughs> you have a good afternoon. You hear me, sister? Thank <laughs> you. Good. Anything we can do to help you, let us know. You hear? Yes. Thank you, That's John. Great. Talk to you soon. Bye. Yes, dear. Take it away, take it away, feeling too good to me Chilling all day, all in your space is where I wanna be Here in this room, what did you do? I just can't get enough Too caught up in your love